Good afternoon. Welcome to the uh, Optical College uh, Colloquium on this beautiful Thursday. It is a great pleasure to welcome back Dan Bukovratovich to give today's colloquium. Dan, it's uh, doubly welcome back because he uh, is an alumni of the University of Arizona and he used to work full time here at the college for uh, 20 years. Prior to working at the college, he worked for the U.S. Army doing optomechanics and then he went to work for National Optical Astronomical Observatories for five years and since then he has been with Raytheon Missiles Company for about 20 years. Dan is uh, a leading expert in optomechanics, a well recognized over the whole world. He has taught extensively optomechanics here at the college for, for 10, 15 years. Then at SPIE uh, conferences since then, so about maybe 35 years teaching optomechanics. First one was in 85. And, um, and then to, throughout the world teaching optomechanics. He has written a number of books about the subject and uh, I was once told that uh, Dan, for those who have flown with him, that uh, he was able to absorb from, say, flying from the East Coast to the West Coast, uh, the contents of a whole technical book. Um, you may ask him if that's true, but I believe it. Um, with this, uh, uh, let us um, welcome Dan Bukovratovich. Thank you, Jose. This is an appreciation certificate for Thank you. here and a pin. I will be happy to wear it, probably at the Photonics West next week. Good afternoon. I'm going to be talking today about binoculars. And most of the people in this room, and I recognize some of you, who probably turned out to heckle me, like Bill Wolf there in the back, uh, are professionals in the optical community. Let's start out by making one thing very clear. When we talk about this subject, by means two. If I had a pair of binoculars, I would have one in each hand. So with that, I've ended the technical content of my talk. That said, there are some different views on binoculars. Here's one from Bauer back in 1920. It's a very resounding endorsement of the whole idea of extending the range of your vision. Binoculars are made to lift his horizon and broaden his landscape, to unveil nature's inaccessible reaches, to expose hidden dangers to the deep, that eyes may see better and farther. That's pretty impressive. But there are some dissenting opinions. For example, there's this one. Definition. Telescope, a device having a relation to the eye similar to that of the telephone to the ear, enabling distant objects to plague us with a multitude of needless details. You might wonder who said this. A very famous sometime resident of Arizona, a gentleman by the name of Ambrose Bierce. By the way, Mr. Bierce uh, vanished around uh, 1900 under very mysterious circumstances. To this day, nobody knows what happened to him, probably because he was prone to making these kinds of statements. Now, when I was here at the university, I had an anonymous student make the comment that anybody can make it complicated. Hopefully, I'm going to make it a little bit less complicated for you in the next hour or so. Okay, what I'm going to be talking about. I'm going to talk first about how we discuss binoculars, the nomenclature associated with a binocular. And then I'm going to talk about a very important topic, binocular performance. A binocular extends our range of vision. How can we determine how much it extends that range of vision? As we will see, there are some mathematical relationships that can be used to understand how a binocular enables you to see further and better. One important topic with binoculars, and one that should be near and dear to those of you who are studying optical design, is distortion. We'll talk a bit about the distortion problem. From the standpoint of usability, a very important topic in binocular design is eye relief. How much distance do we have between the eye lens of the eyepiece and the pupil of our eye? Believe it or not, in the not too distant past, people didn't worry too much about this. And people built fantastic binoculars that were essentially unusable because you couldn't get your eye into the eyepiece. 
Small problem, apparently the optical designers didn't understand human engineering. Collimation is a very serious optomechanical problem. The th one of the things that differentiates a high-end from a low-end binocular is how well the binocular is collimated. So we'll talk about the collimation problem. Erecting prisms are very important. A binocular is a culinary type of telescope. It's a Kellner telescope, Kepler, pardon me, Keplerian telescope. And if one looks through a Keplerian telescope, you will discover that the image is upside down. Now, surveys taken amongst users indicate this is highly undesirable. So we have to find some way to turn the image right side up. This is typically done with a prism assembly. So prisms are sort of the heart and soul of the binocular. They're the thing that enable you to see things right side up of the other, rather than upside down. Weight's a big deal. We're going to talk about wide angle binoculars. Uh, when I was putting this talk together, I actually had to add some material because there's a very spectacular new wide angle mark binocular just came on the market about two years ago. It's a fantastic optical achievement. We'll be talking about that a little bit later on. Okay. So why on earth would you want to use a binocular? When people first started making telescopes, they were expensive. They needed exotic components, these lenses that people weren't too familiar with. And why on earth would you want to look through a telescope with both eyes? Well, one of the most important reasons for looking through an instrument with both eyes rather than one eye is shown in this graph. It's taken from a classic paper by Holm, published way back in 1976. And what he's done is shown us the probability of detection at different contrast levels for targets using one eye, two eyes, and both eyes. And you can see that at low contrast levels, our probability of finding the target is way higher than it would be with one eye. That's really important. If you're a bird watcher looking for that bird to complete your life list way off there in the distance, if you're somebody who's into boating and you're trying to see a boy as the last light is leaving, detecting the target can be very important. And with two eyes, you have a much, much better probability of target detection, especially at the low contrast levels, which are so common in the real world, than you would with just one eye. So the biggest reason to use two eyes rather than one eye is you get much better target detection. A second reason is comfort. If you spend much time squinting through an eyepiece, you will quickly learn that a single eyepiece instrument is very uncomfortable. This is why medical microscopes today are almost always binocular microscopes. People spend a lot of time looking through them. It's much more comfortable to use both eyes than it is a single eye. Last but not least, and this one tends to get sort of pushed off in the corner, but it's actually pretty important, is that a binocular can extend the range of your stereo vision. One can argue, because stereo vision is highly variable in human beings about the range of stereo vision, but typically most people cannot detect stereo beyond, at best, a few hundred meters. With a binocular, you can enhance that stereo distance enormously. Furthermore, if you're looking at something close up, you see things that are enhanced in terms of stereo. I've had the pleasure of visiting Africa a number of times, and in viewing game, I found the enhanced stereo very useful. Very often you could separate, say, a leopard or something hiding behind a bush with stereo that you could not see with your unaided eyes, simply because of the exaggerated stereo effect of the binocular. So stereo perception is a very important part of binocular design. OK. Now, if you go shopping for a binocular, and it's a civilian binocular, you'll probably be working with a civilian binocular, you will find that typically the binocular will have a couple of numbers on it. And these numbers are used to identify the characteristics of the binocular. Typically, there are three numbers that are used to define a binocular. One is the objective diameter. That's a pretty easy one. That's just the size of the objective. For conventional Keplerian type binoculars, the objective is usually, not always, but usually, the entrance pupil to the system. The second number you'll see is magnification. That's usually given in terms of a number followed by an x, you know, 4x, 6x, 10x, 15x, or whatever. That tells you how much the binocular magnifies. The last term is typically the field of view. Now, here the manufacturer do something which is a little strange. 
those of us who are in the technical community might think of field of view as being defined in terms of degrees, or if you're like me, radians. But what the technical com community likes and what the manufacturers do are two different things. Typically, they will give us the field of view as the linear diameter at some distance. Normally, here in the US, this will be taken to be 1,000 yards. In Europe and other places, it'll be 1,000 meters. A convenient approximation is to remember that one degree is about 17.5 meters at 1,000 meters, or about 52 feet at 1,000 yards. So when you pick up a binocular, you will see these numbers. On, typically, they'll be on the back on the IP side where you can see them. And they will tell you the magnification. For example, I'm looking at this little Pentax binocular. It's an 8 by 24, and lo and behold, they put the field in terms of degrees, 7.5 degrees, because they didn't have room to put on the linear field. That's neither here nor there. But that's how we define a binocular. Those are the three numbers that typically people talk about. We can also talk about binoculars in terms of size. Compact binoculars typically have an objective size somewhere between 15 and 25 millimeters. Uh, magnification 6 by to 12. These are the so-called pocket binoculars. This is a good example of a pocket binocular. Question? Yeah. So what exactly is really the difference between the objective size and magnification? Or are they two ways of kind of relating? The, the question is what's the object difference between objective size and magnification? Magnification is, is the amount of times we magnify the scene. So right now I'm looking at you at unity magnification. If I looked at you and you appear to be twice the size you are apparently with the unaided eye, that would be 2x magnification. If you were four times the size of the unaided eye, that would be 4x magnification. The objective size is simply, as I said, the opening at the front of the binocular. That determines how much light passes through the binocular. We'll talk more about that in just a moment. Okay? Does that explain it to you? How big is the lens? And they can get very big. People make binoculars today that have objectives as big as 150 millimeters. That's six inches. Dinner plate size. OK. So this is a compact binocular, 6 by 24. 6x magnification, 24 millimeter objective. Little tiny objectives, less than an inch across. Mid-size, objective size, 30 to 40 millimeters. Again, magnification, 6 to 12. This binocular, this is actually a military binocular. This is an M28. This is sort of verging on the midsize. It's a 7 by 28. And finally, this is a full size. This is a 7 by 50. Again, another military binocular. This is an M19. Finally, we have the giant binoculars, which have an objective beyond 60 millimeters. I did bring one of those with me today for obvious reasons. It wouldn't fit in my briefcase. We can also talk about binoculars in terms of their focus type. A binocular can be center focus, single knob, adjust the focuses of both eyepieces, or it can be individual focus, like the 7 by 50, where we have to turn each eyepiece individually. Typically, binoculars for military, maritime, astronomical applications will be individual focus, because you don't have to play with focus very often once it's set. Civilian binoculars, particularly binoculars for sporting events, bird watchers and such, where you often have to change the focal distance, will be center focus. Also, we can talk about erecting systems. going to talk a lot more about this shortly. Uh, we have two different types of erecting systems. The Poro is the classic. This is a Poro binocular. Or roof. And this is a roof prism binocular. And here again, I've just shown some examples of different size binoculars. The big guy over there is a 15 by 80. And believe it or not, that's fairly lightweight, mainly because of the use of lightweight plastics in the chassis. OK. Now let's talk about the binocular range e equation. Binoculars extend our range of vision. So how can we determine how far we can see with a binocular? We can define the efficiency of a binocular. This is a dimensionless parameter. And the efficiency E is found by dividing the range to which we can see something through the binocular by the range over which we can see something with our unaided eye. So. For example, if I can see that chickadee, I'm a bird watcher, over on a branch, and I can just barely see it at a distance of 10 meters, I put the binocular up to my eye, and now I can see that chickadee uh, 50 meters away. 50 over 10 is 5. And the efficiency would then be said to be a factor of 5. 
So one parameter we can use to characterize binocular range is the ratio of the distance to which we can see something with the unaided eye divided into the distance to which we see it with optical aid. Another way of looking at this, though, is to think about visual acuity. Now, visual acuity is a very different phenomena from target detection. Typically, visual acuity is something that we talk about in terms of our ability to resolve detail. Visual acuity is normally tested by what are using what are called Landau rings. This is a ring which has a gap in it, and these rings have different sizes, different contrasts, and the subject will look at the ring and try to identify the location of the gap. It's basically an eye test. And you can use the Landau ring test both with and without optical aid. This is a more sensitive test in the sense that it determines acuity, our ability to resolve detail rather than detect targets. So another measure of binocular efficiency, which may not correlate with the range measure, is to look at the ratios of acuity, both with and without the binocular. Now here's a tip for you if you're a consumer and you're looking to buy a binocular. There's a very simple test for the optical quality of a binocular. It's called the dollar bill test. Most of us, probably with the possible exception of some of the starving students in the audience, will have a dollar bill with us. If you're in the binocular store, you can put the dollar bill on the wall, make sure you get it back after you've run the test, and look at the details in the dollar bill with your binocular. If you're comparing different binoculars, you can carefully check how well you can see the detail at different distances. This is a surprisingly simple, uh, yet very effective means of determining the quality of a binocular. It's called the dollar bill test. Very easy to do. Most of us don't carry around standard resolution targets in their pockets. Maybe Bill Wolf does, but I don't. No, but I always have a bill. I know that, Bill. <laughs> OK. Now, efficiency is affected by a wide variety of parameters. Magnification, optical transmission, entrance pupil size, ratio of the exit pupil. When we look through the binocular, we see those little circles at the back. Those are the exit pupils. Those are very important in determining how a binocular performs. Seeing luminance, is it night or day? How much do we shake? Have you had your morning cup of coffee or not? Or maybe the morning cup of coffee makes it worse? Those of you who are students in optical sciences, you better be working hard on this problem, correcting the residual optical aberrations, and of course, glare. I'm ignoring atmospheric effects here. This is complicated enough as it is. All right, so how do we put all these factors together? During the Second World War, there were a number of really interesting studies on the efficiency of optical instruments in terms of detecting and resolving targets. There was work uh, was done here by Blackwell, and there was also work that was done in Germany, uh, most notably at a couple of the big optical companies like Zeiss. Post-war, the results of those experiments were published, and two Germans by the name of Kohler and Linos came up with a classic equation that is used to find binocular range. And they said that the efficiency of a binocular goes in accordance with this equation. Now let me walk you through it. M is the magnification of the binocular. D is the diameter of the objective lens of the binocular. And T is the overall transmission of the binocular. X and Z are exponents which will depend upon the seen luminance. They identified three special conditions for this equation. In the first condition, we assume that we are in the daytime, that we are in the daytime. This is defined as a seen luminance above 0.03 candela per square meter. We find that binocular efficiency in the daytime will be proportional to magnification. As we'll see, that's not quite true, but that's what their model says. And it's very weakly dependent upon transmission. A little piece of information for those of you shopping for binocular. Almost all the manufacturers make startling claims about transmission. If you look at that dependence, t to the fourth, it's not very important, at least not for daytime use. I'll come back to that in a moment. Now, twilight is a very important time of the day. A lot of wildlife is very active in twilight. So twilight is really important. If you're a bird watcher, if you're a wildlife enthusiast, twilight is a, a good time to bag rare birds, hard to see uh, animals, and so forth. We can define twilight as between about 
001 candela per square meter and about 0 0.03 candela per square meter. And we see that in twilight, efficiency goes as the product of the magnification time the diameter to the one half power, and it's a little bit more strongly dependent upon transmission. This term, and I'll come back to it, is called the twilight efficiency. Last but not least, if it gets really dark, we can talk about nighttime conditions where the illumination level is below 001 candela per square meter. And now it turns out that we're back to dependence upon magnification, but there's a caveat which we'll see in just a moment. And we'll see a much stronger dependence on transmission. The classical night glass needs to have high transmission. That's an important parameter. Now, let's talk a bit about transmission. Overall transmission of a binocular goes roughly as a power law where the power is the number of elements in the binocular. About the simplest type of binocular you can build will have about six air to glass interfaces, two for the objective, two for the prisms, and two, believe it or not, for the eyepieces. You can actually design an eyepiece with just two air to glass interfaces. More complicated binoculars, and we'll see some examples of those a little later on today, can have as many as 16 air glass interfaces. If the lenses and prisms are not optically coated, we have transmission losses at each air to glass interface, and this will knock down the transmission substantially. It was not at all unusual for binoculars in the era before optical coatings became available to have an overall transmission of about 50%. That means you're throwing away half the light. Around the Second World War, coatings became available, single layer anti-reflection AR coatings, and this rather substantially boosted the transmission of the binocular. Today, we have multi-layer coatings that can easily boost overall transmission through the entire binocular to 95%. Phenomenal improvement since the Second World War. Now, there are some issues. The simple single layer anti-reflection coatings are typically peaked for a single wavelength. And this means the transmission falls off on either side of that peak. And hence, the binocular may do some funny things to the color of the scene you're looking at. People talk about binoculars being warm or cold. And this is usually influenced by the optical coatings. If the coating doesn't transmit very well in the blue, if the coating doesn't transmit very well in the red, you may have a strange color cast when you look through the binocular. And many people find this highly objectionable. One of the things that uh, more sophisticated binocular users will insist on is they want a purity of color through their binocular. How important this is depends upon the application. If you're watching a football game, probably not. If you're trying to identify the feathers on some exotic bird, probably pretty important. So this just shows the difference between a single layer coating that's been peaked for a single wavelength, right around the middle of the visible, 550 nanometers, and a multi-layer coating, which has got a much broader plateau. This is a rather phenomenal uh, performance, by the way. This is up over 95% over quite a broadband range. And I find it amazing. When I first got into the business, people couldn't do this, but people can now. This is, this is very good. Uh, from the standpoint of giving you true color. Something like this, obviously you're going to get degradation of color due to the fallout and transmission on either side of the peak. Now, another issue that comes up is the fact that we humans are not terribly stable supports for optical instruments. And if I pick up a binocular and look through it, I'll find that the image is moving around. One cannot hold an optical instrument perfectly still. Now, over 30 years ago, when I was here at the University of Arizona, I had a sponsor who was interested in this problem, and we actually did some research on it. We, we did uh, land old testing, and we actually looked at the ranges that we could get with uh, different amounts of shake and with different observers. It was really interesting. Um, make a long story short, it turns out and this is a gross simplification. I could talk at great length about shake in human beings. But it, most binoculars will shake at a frequency of about 9 hertz with about a quarter of a degree peak to peak amplitude. Interestingly enough, the weight of the binocular doesn't seem to matter very much. It certainly matters from the standpoint of fatigue in terms of how long you can use the binocular. 
but it doesn't have much to do with how much the binocular actually shakes, at least not until you start getting fatigued. So this shaking causes the image to move. That velocity of the image degrades the ability of the user to see detail. It turns out that one can write a relatively simple relationship between magnification and the reduction in range or efficiency, and that equation is shown here. It goes basically inversely as the magnification. I've plotted it over here. Along this axis, I've plotted magnification, and along this axis, I've plotted the efficiency. Now, if you look at the market, you'll find that it's rare to encounter binocular with a magnification above 10x. There are some binoculars that go to 12x and 15x, but by the time you get to 20x magnification, they're few and far between, and usually they have a tripod mount. The reason for this is that if you plot efficiency as a function of magnification, you will find that you don't get much improvement once you get beyond about 10x. And if you go, for example, from 10x to about 18x, factor of about 1.8, you may actually see some fall off in performance due to the increased amount of shake. Also note that even though you're magnifying by a factor of 10, the efficiency does not go directly with the magnification, but it's more like 6. Again, that's because of this tremble. So this limits how much magnification we can use. For most people, the upper limit of magnification is about 7 or 8. It should come as no surprise to you that the overwhelming majority of binoculars that are sold have a magnification of around 7x or 8x. And going to higher magnifications typically does not buy you very much. If you're very steady and you learn some tricks, a 10x is quite usable. 12x is hard. 15x is very hard. You better have some way to brace it. 18x is silly. That's the nicest way I can put it. This chart also compares supported versus unsupported binoculars. And you see, we pick up uh, about a factor of one and a half by going to support, in some cases, about a factor of two. So tremble is a big problem. And for that reason, people have worked very hard on trying to make it go away. And the way we make tremble go away is, first of all, use a tripod. Put the binocular on a tripod. Now, the problem with that is that the binoculars intend to be a handheld device. And if you're going, for example, to the opera or to a play or sporting event, it's hard to carry a tripod around with you. Tripods are also awkward things to use if you're, say, trying to follow the action in a football game. Pretty hard to pan around with your tripod. So tripods are useful, but they're limited in terms of their applicability. What people have done instead is work on active means of stabilizing the image. The earliest attempts to do this bolted a great big gyro with a tungsten flywheel to the binocular. This worked, but it was heavy, and one needed to carry around a battery pack that weighed a lot more than the gyro and the uh, binocular put together. So although a number of these systems were sold, they were not too terribly popular. What happened instead is that people got a little bit more clever, and they came up with some very interesting ways to stabilize the image. Zeiss came up with a perfectly passive system. I'm not going to get too deeply into this, but basically what Zeiss did was build a part of the optical system on some very slinky springs. And these springs are tuned to have a very low fundamental frequency, so they essentially act as vibration isolators. They have a frequency that's on the over a hertz or so, and they very effectively, passively compensate for this 9 hertz tremble. This is a really interesting uh, approach. It has the problem of expense and fragility. These ice binocular comes with a mechanical lock that you have to engage before you move the binocular, because if you move it abruptly, you may damage the springs. A better solution is to have a little tiny gyro sensor inside the binocular. And this is something we can do thanks to the wonders of modern microelectronics. And then to move a prism using some small motors. This is done by Fujinon, their 16 by 40 stable scope. A similar approach is used by Canon and their image stabilized binoculars, except instead of moving a prism, they move a lens. Note that when I do stabilization, I don't care about vertical motion. What I care about is angular motion. And gyros are pretty good about detecting that. So what I really care about is angular motion. A motion up or down from looking at the distance typically will not cause any effective motion in the eyepiece. 
The question is, are little fiber optics gyros? Sometimes. Believe it or not, some of them use spinning gyros. Really. The early Fujinons had a spinning gyro in them. Uh, that's one of the reasons why they cost as much as a compact car. But uh, they did have little, little moving gyros in them, believe it or not. So as a rule of thumb, the efficiency of a stabilized binocular is about twice that of a 7x binocular. So basically, you get back everything you've lost from that tremble. Now, you pay for this. Well, you pay for it out of your pocketbook because it's going to cost you more money. The binocular is going to be bigger and heavier, and it usually has to have a battery. But for many people, uh, this is a huge advantage. I'll just give you one anecdote from my own experience. As I said, I've been to uh, Africa a number of times. And this has never been for hunting or something. It's because I've been invited down there to teach. And every time I go there, I go out uh, and look at the game. And I've used a wide variety of binoculars to do this. Uh, I kept upgrading my binoculars. And I was using a 1050 binocular. Now, I'm married to a relatively petite lady. and she has trouble with my big 1050. So when she went with me to South Africa, we took an 8x32 roof prism binocular. And it was a disaster because I could see things through the 10x that she couldn't see through the 8x. This led to some, let's just say, some marital discord. So we finally solved that problem. On our next trip to South Africa, I had a brainstorm. And I got my significant other a stabilized binocular. And now she can see things I can't see with my 10x. So she's very happy. Uh, we had another chance to go to South Africa. She used the stabilized binocular, and she was absolutely delighted. Leopards, lions, tiger, whatever. So she was a, a very happy camper. Stabilized binoculars work. And if you have trouble with tremble, uh, or you want to simply improve the overall performance of your optical instrument, this is a good solution. Now, here's another interesting thing. Everybody talks about binoculars in terms of objective size. It's a 50 millimeter objective. But in the daytime, we don't use all that glass. The human eye pupil in the daytime opens to maybe two, two and a half millimeters. And as a result, your eye acts to diaphragm down the size of the objective. And you're only using, typically in the daytime, the center third of something like a 50 millimeter binocular. Because of that, Having something like a 1050 in the daytime is silly because you're not using all the light that's coming through that objective. This is a 1025. These two binoculars have exactly the same performance in the daytime. The reason for that is that you're limited by the size of the pupil of your eye. Now, there's another aspect of this. How many optical designers have we got here? How many people here are doing optical design? Few of you. Anyway, if you're an optical designer, you will know that fast achromatic objectives are not pretty. They have a lot of optical aberrations. The objective of the typical binocular works at about f5. The 50 millimeter f5 objective is awful. The nicest way I can put it. Even with good glasses and good optical design practice, it will have a strong residual aberrations. However, you're not using it at f5 during the daytime. You're only using the central third of the objective, and hence it's now working like something like a 15 millimeter f15, and that's going to have excellent optical performance. When you do use the full diameter of the objective, it's nighttime, and the resolving power of your eye has fallen off so dramatically, you can't tell if it's a good objective or not. So binoculars are actually self-correcting from the standpoint of their optical aberration. This is a very clever trick the designers have used for over a century to ensure that we have adequate optical performance without making the binocular hopelessly big and heavy from the standpoint of optical design. Although so you will see in a moment, we've gone some distance with respect to complexity. Now, travel efficiency is a very important parameter for many users. This is the condition we have in twilight. We can define this for what's called meso mesoptic vision, where the scene luminance is between 001 candela per square meter and 03 candela per square meter. And in the twilight condition, we find that the efficiency goes as the product of magnification times the <coughs> parameter to one half power. 
This number is called the twilight efficiency, and if you go to binocular catalog, they will invariably give this number for the binocular. This is a very important parameter for most binocular users, and everybody who's in the business of making binoculars will always be able to tell you what the twilight efficiency is. This determines how well you can see things when the lighting is not perfect and that magic zone between sunset and full darkness. Very important parameter, a lot of game, a lot of wildlife, a lot of things happen in that category. The military loves the twilight efficiency parameter because when do people attack? First light. So it's very important to be able to see things as early as you can. And that puts a premium on twilight efficiency. Want to make sure nobody's sneaking up on it. Now, the interesting thing about twilight efficiency is it's a combination of magnification diameter. So you can trade these two numbers against each other. For example, we know that 8 by 30, 7 by 35, and 10 by 25 all have essentially the same twilight efficiency. A 10 by 25 binocular is usually a lot smaller and easier to carry around than 7 by 35. So if you're looking for a general purpose small binocular that will still have some performance in twilight, you may be able to go up a little bit in magnification, down a little bit in terms of objective diameter and give up no performance. Now, of course, when you get to full size binoculars, you get very good twilight efficiency. A 1050 is usually considered the king of the twilight. Very serious bird watchers will use a 1050. It's a lot of optics I would look around. Now, this is an almost obsolescent topic, but I think it needs to be discussed because people build, still build binoculars to meet the specification. Another important type of performance condition is nighttime. Nighttime is when we have very low light, typically 001 candela per square meter, and we find that in nighttime conditions, the resolution of the human eye falls off very dramatically. And what a night glass does, uh, the so-called night binocular, is make things large enough that with the degraded resolution capability of our eyes, we can see them. Note that a night glass does not increase brightness. It can increase size, but it cannot increase brightness. All it's basically doing is making things bigger. Without going into a lot of discussion about how the human visual system works, as lighting falls off, it's harder and harder for us to see small detail. <clears throat> and the bigger things are, the easier they are to see. Now, it turns out <coughs> that for nighttime conditions, what's important is the exit pupil binocular, that little disc, it's got all the light coming through the barrel, exactly matches the size of the dark adaptive pupil. If the exit pupil is bigger than that, efficiency falls off. If it's smaller than that, efficiency falls off. It is usually assumed, and I'm going to say more about this, that the size of the fully dark adapted pupil is seven millimeters. So when one builds a night glass, you design the night glass to have a seven millimeter pupil. This is a night glass. It's a seven by 50. It has a 7.1 millimeter pupil. In Europe, you will find a lot of people using night glasses that are 8 by 56, again with a 7 millimeter pupil. Uh, some military binoculars have been built that were 15 by 120s, which had 8 millimeter pupils. Some individuals who are in good condition will have pupils that open up to 8 millimeters or more. Now, this is a chart taken from Colin Reynolds' classic 1957 paper, and it shows you how twilight efficiency as well as the night glass perform. This is a 15 by 50 binocular. This is a 10 by 50 binocular, two different contrast ratios. This is a 7 by 50. So these binoculars have excellent daytime performance. They also do pretty well in twilight. Remember, product of magnification times objective to one half power. But as soon as the light starts to go, that 7 by 50 starts to win out. Quite dramatically, about a factor of one and a half in some cases. So matching pupils is very important. So today, the 7x50 binocular is considered the classic night glass. It's used mostly by military folk people and by people who are on boats and ships and such. It is, to be blunt, obsolescent. 
We have better ways of seeing in the dark today. But the 7x50 clings on, people keep buying them. Uh, they're certainly cheaper than most night vision systems, the thermal imagers, although prices are coming down. I have to say that. I've got a thermal imager that goes on my cell phone. Uh, that said, the 7x50, I think, is definitely on a, a short leash from the standpoint of its future. I think there will always be some around, but I think the market's going to get smaller and smaller and smaller because there are better ways to see things today in the dark. Then you can get a pretty good infrared camera to attach to your cell phone for about 100 to 200 bucks. I've got one. So <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you what you know. Yeah. Listen to the quiet. Yeah. Well, that's, that's why I say that the 7x50 night glass is obsolescent. You know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to stay around. People are conservative, and it's cheaper to buy a uh, 59.95 night glass your friendly neighborhood convenience store than it is to go out and buy an IR camera. But uh, I think it's, it's on its last rows. People are going to find other ways to see things in the dark. They haven't already. Now, let's talk a little bit about how pupil size varies. I mentioned that the size of the dark adapted pupil is about 7 millimeters. The maximum size of the dark adapted pupil of the human being will vary depending upon the illumination conditions. Uh, for a fully dark adapted eye, it goes over, up over about 7 millimeters. And in the daytime, it may get down to 2 millimeters even smaller. You walk around in Arizona in June without sunglasses <laughs> on, you're probably looking at pinpoint pupils. Uh, your eyes don't like all that light. Now, dark adaption requires at least 30 minutes in total darkness. So the assumption of a 7 millimeter pupil, it's common literature, but it's not really very common. Not many of us are going to sit in a dark room for half an hour before we go out and use our binocular. What's even more interesting is that pupil size changes as a function of age. This is a plot of average pupil size as a function of age. You can see if you're a healthy 20-year-old, you have a 7.5 millimeter pupil, but if you're a healthy 70-year-old, your pupil size is down around 5 millimeters. From a practical standpoint, this means the most general purpose binoculars should have a pupil size of about 5 millimeters or so. There are a couple of reasons for this. You don't know what the age is of the user. You don't know whether or not uh, they have dark adapted or not before they use your magic optical instrument. So there are good reasons to keep the size of the pupil down around 5 millimeters. Now, of course, you're building a night glass, more power to you. There have been military night glasses made <coughs> as big as 8 millimeters. During the Second World War, the Japanese Navy did not enjoy the technical superiority of radar that the U.S. Navy did, and they were very dependent upon optical aid. So the Japanese Navy screened recruits for pupil size and night vision. And they built a whole range of extremely effective optical instruments which had pupil sizes of 8 millimeters or so. They were intended for use by these specially selected sailors. Now, of course, when the sailors got tired, uh, if they got older, their pupil size shrank, at which point they were probably disposable as far as the Japanese Navy was concerned. But it did give them a tremendous advantage in the early years of the Pacific War. So pupil size can be pretty important. Now, one thing to keep in mind of all this is you see these nice lines on these graphs. You think to yourself, well, you know, I understand this really well. Let me show you what the scatter is in terms of variability in human visual performance. This is the variability of pupil size for age taken from a classic study. And you can see that, yes, I can draw a nice line through the middle of that data, but look at the scatter. It's very difficult to make precise evaluations of human visual performance. There's an enormous amount of variability uh, from person to person in terms of visual performance. And as a result, attempts to quantify visual performance with complex mathematical expressions or very detailed studies usually crater when people are up against the fact that, you know, we're all different when it comes to our actual visual performance. My wife is an Egyptologist. She's an archaeologist, and she spends a lot of time in, in Egypt. And she found this rather charming chart, which was taken from a study that was done by some optometrists who visited Egypt. They compared the pupil size of Egyptians with the pupil size of Europeans. The curves are the same, but note that they're lower. There are a variety of reasons that have been advanced for this. 
Uh, one can talk about diode, exposure, strong light, and so forth. This is not to say that uh, the Egyptians can't see very well in the dark. I'm here to tell you they can. But it is interesting that between these two populations, we see rather dramatic <coughs> variation in maximum pupil size as a function of age. So anytime people start talking about human visual performance, keep in mind there's an awful lot of variability in visual performance. And trying to nail down the performance of a human observer to a couple decimal places is probably an exercise in folly. There's simply too much variability. Question? Have people gone so far to use eye drops that dilate the pupil? The question is, have people gone so far as to use eye drops that dilate the pupils? The answer is absolutely. I know a number of lunatic amateur astronomers who've done exactly that. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't recommend it, by the way. <laughs> um, I was involved in an auto accident where somebody attempted to drive a car after their pupils were dilated. Not a good thing to do. Oh. So it does happen. But yes, um, there are individuals who will use eye drops to dilate their eyes. Hopefully they don't try to drive afterwards. So when Haley's Comet came around, there were a whole group of amateurs who wanted to be the first one to recover Haley's Comet visual. I know the gentleman who actually did it. And they actually went to this extent. They were going up on top of mountains with telescopes and eyeballing their eyeballs. The guy who did it did it uh, with an unaided, with his basically uh, eye with no eye drops or such. He just happened to have exceptional vision. So, yeah, but people do it. I don't recommend it. But people do foolish things, then they put it on YouTube. <laughs> okay, let's talk about distortion. Distortion is a surprisingly subtle problem. If you know a little bit about optical design, you will realize you cannot correct all the aberrations of an optical system. And one of the aberrations that the optical designer usually kind of leaves hanging out there is distortion. And we can talk about two kinds of distortion, angular distortion and rectilinear distortion. With angular distortion, geometry is not changed, however magnification changes across the field of view. This means that an object in the center of the field of view will appear to be a different size once over on the edge of the field of view. With rectilinear distortion, straight lines curve. Now, if you're a sailor, this is extremely disconcerting because when a sailor looks through a binocular at the ocean, they expect to see the ocean as a straight line not curving. That gives them some queasy uh, feelings. So maritime binoculars are usually well corrected for rectilinear distortion. Almost all night glasses, 7 by 50s are made for maritime use today, and they'll be corrected for rectilinear distortion. However, if we correct for rectilinear distortion, we can't correct for angular distortion. And now we have an interesting effect. If we're looking for a binocular, and we move the binocular, as we move the binocular, the size of an object in the center of the field of view will appear to change. Now, your brain is not real smart when it comes to interpreting scenes through binoculars. And it thinks to itself, OK, if this thing is changing in size, the distance to the thing I'm looking at must be changing as well. And the only way that can happen is if the scene itself is distorted. So what this do, does is produce an optical illusion that the scene that you're looking at, thanks to the change in angular magnification, is curving. And the world appears to be mapped onto a spherical surface. And if you move the binocular, it appears that objects are rolling along the spherical surface. And hence, this is called the rolling ball illusion. This is extremely disquiet. It can actually produce physical nausea in a binocular observer after a period of time. This was discovered in the First World War. People had uh, really looked for binoculars for a long period of time before that. Maybe they had, but the, the population was very limited. But now they had lots and lots of soldiers looking for binoculars for long periods of time. People didn't know about rolling ball. And people got physically ill. It was discovered that you could correct the rolling ball illusion very simply by uh, letting a little bit of residual pin cushion distortion into the eyepiece. And today, almost all commercial binoculars, especially those intended for non-maritime applications, will have some residual pin cushion distortion. 
I've had people who were not familiar with monocular performance, but knew something about optical design and optical aberrations, pick up the monocular and say, hey, this thing's terrible. It's got pincushion distortion. It's there for a reason. <clears throat> it's there to keep you from getting sick when you're looking through your monocular. That's a very important reason, at least to me it is. By the way, this is my one and only entry to Wiki, Wikipedia, and I didn't do it. Somebody simply cited me. Okay, now the other thing that can cause physical illness when you look through binocular is collimation. Collimation is the angle between the two optical axes of the binocular. Now, we're used to seeing things with two eyes. We see distance by our eyes looking at the angle between the two lines or optical axes of our eyes. We do a little bit of trigonometry, and I look up and say, well, that's a Bill Wolfie sitting in the back of the room. That's probably maybe 10, 15 meters away, maybe. Now, if a binocular is well aligned, and I look through it, it's as if I'm using my eyes. If the binocular is not so well aligned, I can have two possible conditions. One is a variation in alignment in the horizontal plane. And that's not too bad. Your brain's used to that. It says, okay, uh, this is just a little bit stranger way for me to determine the distance of the thing I'm looking at. That's called divergence or convergence, depending upon whether or not the two axes are going away from each other or going towards each other. Much more serious though is a condition called divergence, where the two optical axes are separated in the vertical plane. Your brain doesn't care for that at all, and if you use a binocular that has some divergence, it can actually again make you physically ill very undesirable. So the optical axes have to be very closely aligned. How closely is very closely? Well, this is a highly controversial community topic in the community. I've given some numbers for divergence, convergence, and divergence from a variety of different studies. This is one that was done way back in 1943 by Jacobs. It cited a lot. This was a study that was done in Russia. They obviously wanted to push the limits as hard as they could. The M19, which I've got right here, was made to a tolerance of 4.4 milliradians in divergence, 5.8 in convergence, and 5.8 in divergence. Now, this drives the cost of the binocular rather dramatically. In manufacture of the M19, an error of 2.5 microns of tolerance, that's 1 ten thousandth of an inch, produced a 1 arc minute alignment error. So the tolerances that were used to assemble this binocular were on the order of microns. That was necessary to hold the alignment of the two optical axes. These are scaling numbers. They are one of the things that drives the cost of a high-end binocular. One of the big advantages of an expensive binocular over a cheap one is typically it's better collimated. Okay, now let's talk about erecting prisms. The classic type of erecting prism is the polar prism. This uses four bounces to turn the image right side up. And over, over here we see the inside of a classic coral binocular. This is made by 30 from Zeiss circa 1954. Note the telephone objective and the very complicated eyepiece. Polos were very common, but they, they sort of fall out of favor in stating that you use roof prisms today. Now here's another thing that we need to watch out for when we were looking for binoculars. You may have had the experience of picking up a low-end, relatively inexpensive binocular. You look through it, and you expect to see round edge of pupils. You don't. Your pupils are square. How on earth can an optical instrument with round lenses produce square exit pupils? This really bothered me when I started saying it. It turns out that light is lost from each of the bounces of the total internal reflecting surfaces of the polar prism if the condition for total internal reflection is not met by all of the rays. When the objective is very fast, and most of the binocular objectives are very fast, and when the index of refraction of the polar prism glass is very low, which it will be in a low end binocular, we will not meet the condition for total internal reflection. We'll have light loss in each one of those four surfaces. And if you map the geometry, you end up with a square rather than round pupil. 
This does wonderful things to the transmission and modulation transfer function of the blocker. That's putting it rather mild. Uh, square apertures are not what you want. What high end manufacturers do is increase the index of refraction of the binocular. Very often in advertisements for binoculars, you will see that the prisms use BAK4 glass. What the manufacturer is telling you is that he's used a relatively high index glass in order to maintain circular pupils. Keep in mind that uh, it may be necessary to use some very high index glass. As a matter of fact, people have gone all the way up to F2 for some binocular applications. So this is where we have square pupils with round lenses in binoculars. Very undesirable, but extremely common in low-end binoculars. Now, there are other kinds of prisms that we can use. Today, roof prism binoculars are very popular. They're popular because they're compact. This is a relatively compact thing to carry around in comparison with that big 7x50. One type of erecting prism we can use is the Abbe Coin prism. This has a roof. Basically, we take the image, separate the two parts, and then put it back together again. Here's the inside of a Zeiss 8x40 using an Abbe Coin erecting prism. A couple things to note. Note that the objective incorporates no less than four elements and that the binocular is focused by moving that fourth element. You can see the Abbe Koenig erecting prism assembly and the eyepiece. This is a straight line configuration. <coughs> this is very compact, but it has one big drawback, and that's that it doesn't enhance your stereo vision as much as the Polo prism does, because the Polo moves the optical axes further apart. Also, it tends to be more expensive than the Polo prism binocular. We can also use the Schmidt Pichon prism. Here's an example of a Swarovski 8x32 binocular. Again, no very complicated design. Multiple bounces with the roof. Now, it turns out that this roof does some really bad things to the optical beam passing through the binocular. Basically, you take the beam apart into two pieces and put it back together again. And there are some very interesting polarization and diffraction effects. And for a long time, roof prism binoculars were grossly inferior to four prism binoculars because of the problems with these roof prisms. However, thanks to the development of the, of the single lens reflex camera, people learned how to correct these problems with roof prisms. Largely, they're putting so-called phase coatings on the surfaces of the roof to minimize these polarization and diffraction problems. And today, you can buy very high quality roof prism binoculars. So this would not have probably come about if it hadn't been for the development of the single lens reflex camera with that erecting pentaprism on the top. Mounting prisms imp is important. If you're shopping for a binocular, one of the things you can do, take a binocular, turn it around, and look through the objective lenses with a strong light, you just happen to have one on you, and you can actually see the prisms, and you can see how the prisms are mounted. If you can see some healthy mechanical straps, as shown here, the chances are pretty good that your binocular will survive a blow without damage. But if all you can see are some small dots of adhesion, the chances are pretty good that if you drop your binocular, you're going to convert it from an expensive optical instrument to an expensive optical router. Here we see a classic strap type of mount. I just happen to have a strap mounted prism assembly, which I can pass around. I don't know if we'll get it around the whole room, but we can talk, but I'll pass it around. So you can see how a strap mount works. Very robust. Here's a cautionary tip. This is the M19. Got one right here. This is perhaps one of the most sophisticated military binoculars ever built. It's a marvel of optical engineering and optical mechanics. It was built by Bill and Howell. For a while, they were making it. Uh, in the 1980s, the production rate of $2,000 a month, costing the taxpayers about $1,800 a piece. You can now pick up an M19 on eBay, and I strongly recommend you don't do this, for about 100 bucks. Now, why is such an optical marvel so inexpensive today? The M19 was very advanced. It used a whole series of clever optomechanical and optical configurations. Long arm relief was obtained through the use of a negative element and a telephoto three element uh, objective, incorporated a field flatter. And when you didn't use straps, all the prisms in place. The prisms were bonded in place. This is a look down the barrel of M19. Not this one, but another one that fell apart. 
The prisons were held in place by Norlin 61 adhesive. They were supposed to survive 1275 consecutive uh, G shocks. 1275 G shocks. That's a lot. They did. The MIT met the requirement for 12 consecutive 75 G shocks. Only problem was that was a completely arbitrary specification on the part of the US military. They had no clues to what the actual acceleration levels were for a military binocular. In service, the binocular prisms failed. This is not easy, this is not difficult to understand. Soldiers are not terribly careful about the equipment that's issued to them. The soldier has a binocular around their neck and they die for cover when they come under fire. The last thing in the world they're going to be worrying about is that binocular. And binoculars often get used by soldiers for applications such as driving tent stakes out in the desert. If you think I'm kidding, you should go out and maneuver sometime with a military unit. You'll see this with, with your own eyes. So the M19 met the specification. It was an excellent binocular. The problem was this was not a realistic specification. It's interesting to note that the M22, which replaced the M19 in US military service, returned to, you guessed it, metal straps told the binocular prisons in place. Now, people studied a lot of four prison binoculars. Four prisons are almost an endangered species. And this is a hard thing to understand. Roof prison binoculars cost more to make than poor prison binoculars, and they offer no advantage in weight. The only advantage they have is they're a bit more compact. There is a trend today towards lighter binoculars. For example, the US M17 military binocular weighed 1.4 kilograms. The M19 weighed less than one kilogram. Most general purpose binoculars today will weigh about 0.7 kilograms and make something like an 8 by 30, which is pretty handy and easy to carry around if you're a bird watcher, will weigh about half a kilo. Upper limit for handheld use is about two kilograms. And I can tell you from personal experience, that's a pretty heavy binocular to use for any length of time. Now, back in the 1950s and 1960s, you could buy wide angle consumer binoculars. This trend was first started by Zeiss way back in 1935. Zeiss built a spectacular binocular, the Delram 8x40, which had 11.2 degree field of view. That's almost 90 degrees in terms of apparent field of view. Very spectacular achievement. For what it's worth, this was way back in 1935, the eyepiece for the Delram was a spheric. It had a spheric element. That was a manufacturing nightmare circa 1935 because I was able to bring it off. In the 50s and up until the 1980s, wide angle binoculars were very popular. I used to use a 7x35, which had an 80 degree field of view. They were awful. That's the nicest way I can put it. Their optical aberrations were not very well corrected, and they had almost no eye relief. We can see what happened looking at the evolution of the classic Zeiss 8x30 binocular. In 1954, the 8x30 had 8.5 degree field of view with only 9 millimeters of eye relief. Very hard to see the whole field of view because it was hard to get your eye right into the eyepiece. But spectacularly large field of view. Now, Zeiss quickly realized there are people who wear these things called eyeglasses, and it might be desirable to have more eye relief so you can see a little bit more of the field of view. So by making the field of view narrower, they were able to push the eye relief back to 19 millimeters. Generally, if you've got about 15 millimeters of eye relief, you can look at the full field with your eyeglasses on, so 19 is even better. However, this is a pretty narrow field of view. This gives sort of a tunnel-like uh, view of the world. Generally speaking, you'd like to have at least 60 degree apparent field to get full scene immersion when you look through a binocular, and this is only about 50 degrees. By doing some clever optical tricks, notably by using a telephoto objective, and a longer focal length eyepiece, they were able to bring up the field of view to about 7.4 degrees with again 19 millimeters of eye relief. And today, 60 degrees is a pretty common field, apparent field of view for most high end binoculars. There are attempts from time to time to build true wide angle binoculars. Way back in 2004, my OG introduced the Byron 7x50, which had 9.5 degree field of view, 7x50. Look at the size of the eyepieces to get that long eye relief and wide field of view. The big of the objectives. Uh, one might think that if you were a small person, you might have no trouble adjusting the uh, interpupillary distance for this big of an rocket. This was not a successful design, and it went off the market. 
So that was the state of the art. And then in 2017, Nikon handed the centennial. And Nikon introduced a very remarkable binocular, the 10 by 50 WX. This was a special model for the 100 year Nikon anniversary. It's a 10 by 50. It has just about every optical trick in it you can imagine. Three extra dispersion lenses per barrel, field flattener, have a cone directing prisms. It weighs two and a half kilograms. It is not a binocular one casually hand holds. However, it has an incredible field of view, 90 degree apparent field of view, with 15.3 millimeters of eye relief. And if you want to purchase one, you look it up today, it'll run you about 6,400 big ones. This is a spectacular achievement. I've shown the <coughs> interior binocular over here. You can see the objective. There are actually three lenses there, although they're a little hard to see. The uh, epicolor directing prism, that's a field flattening assembly, and then the rather complicated eyepiece. This is a conventional 10 by 50. And by the way, this one has about a 65 degree apparent field of view. This is the Nikon 1050. Note the difference in size, and take a look at the size of the eyepieces. They're as big as the objectives of this portable 1050. This is a stunning technical achievement. It's a good example of what you can do if you ignore things like size, weight, and cost. Uh, obviously, uh, Nikon wanted to show off what they could do technically. They did, they did this extremely well. But these are available. You can write a check and get one of these if you desperately need one to look at that chickadee in the branch over there. Uh, I would suggest, though, this is something that should be restricted to student athletes because holding up two and a half kilograms is not easy, at least not for any period of time. And only they can afford it. <laughs> How can they afford it? Only they can afford it. Only they can afford it. Agreed. Only the student athletes can probably afford it. We won't go there, Bill. Okay. So, let's summarize. I've given you quite a lot of information now about monocular performance. Uh, we call, we discussed the color minus range equation for the binocular. We talked about daytime, twilight, and night uses the binocular. We saw the handheld efficiency is only about 50% of supported efficiency. Let's talk about some possible trends. Lighter materials are coming. Our glass polycarbonate has been tried. A number of uh, binoculars were built with plastic barrels. They have not proven to be too terribly popular. As a matter of fact, even the military's experiment with plastic barrel binoculars. Today, the trend is towards magnesium for binocular bodies to get the weight down. Stabilization is available, but it's not in widespread use, largely because of the cost. Roof prisms are replacing the portal prism binocular. Size is creeping up. When I first got started in this business, the standard civilian binocular was a 7x35. <coughs> Today it's 8x30, and we're seeing 8.5x42s and so forth. Size is creeping up. So the quote general purpose uncoat binocular is becoming larger and larger. Field of view is stabilizing around 60 degrees, although as we've seen there are periodic attempts to reintroduce wide angle designs. There are, however, some remaining issues. The M19 is an optical masterpiece, but it's terrible with respect to test straight light. There was no specification for straight light control in this binocular when it was designed. So its performance with respect to glare is terrible. We don't really have good indices of performance from the standpoint of glare and straight light. This is an area that needs to be developed. The rolling ball problem is still very much with us. It remains very controversial. Uh, Sorowski just introduced a line of binoculars for bird watchers which correct for rectilinear distortion. They do not have any pincushion distortion. Very controversial in the community. I know some of the designers uh, and Zeiss and Sarowski, and there's a lot of debate about what should be done about rolling ball. This is a, a hot topic in the community right now. The night glass is not as common as it used to be because not modern night vision systems. We've talked about that. And as we've seen, although a common consumer item, their binocular performance is relatively complex. I'm going to note that this is very unlikely to be the last word of binocular performance, at least I hope not. Now, every time I give this talk, after the talk, people come up and say, well, you know, what binoculars should I buy? <laughs> so let's talk about that. <laughs> Postscript, some fearless fix or what should I buy? If you want a general purpose binocular, I recommend an 8x40. 5 millimeter pupils, maximum for most users. 8x is maximum magnification for most users. Worth the portal. 
And I'll tell you, uh, this is my personal highly biased uh, preference was made by 30, a little bit smaller, a little bit easier to carry around. If you're an astronomer or you don't mind lugging around a bow anchor for a binocular, the 10 by 50 is a pretty good uh, choice. 500 pupils maximum for most users and conditions. 10x is acceptable for most experienced users. Of course, everybody thinks they're an experienced user. <laughs> and Polos typically will give you the best value for your money. For combat applications, if you're traveling, and if you don't have a binocular when you're traveling, you should. There are some remarkable things you can do with a binocular when you travel. For example, when my wife and I saw the Sistine Chapel in Rome, we both had binoculars. We had close focus binoculars, and it puts a whole new perspective on the artwork when you can see it in very close detail, very spectacular. I can highly recommend that. So if you're visiting a museum, uh, going to an athletic event, many things, a small binocular can be very useful, and you can buy a lot of binocular today for not a lot of money. You know, $200 will get you a very good compact binocular. You can throw it in your pocket and have it with you when you need it. So 8 by 20. And last but not least, if you're interested in going out at night and seeing things, uh, 7 by 50 is the classic night place. So with that, and we're before 5 o'clock, so I've gone through before a lot of time, I will end my discussion on binoculars. May you extend your range of vision. Thank you.